This past week, uh, Beverly got a call on her cell phone, and uh, she just made me a good batch of good old chocolate chip cookies, and I was enjoying that. And I, I, I kind of promised to wash the dishes, so I was washing some dishes while she was on the phone. And, and she comes over to me while I'm washing dishes, and she said, uh, uh, one church member is on the phone, she's got a question for you. I said, well, what is it? She said, what's the most important ingredient in a good sermon? And my mind's turning over, and I'm thinking, well, Christ, salvation. I said, well, what does she have in mind? She said, well, the, she says that the most important ingredient in a good sermon is shortening. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I roll my eyes, of course, at that. I, I hope you both packed lunch today. Uh, <laughs> you can blame Miss George for that one. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, let's be turning back again this morning to uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. We come back to chapter 1 this morning. Last Sunday we... We focus mostly on one phrase, really, from verse 18, which was wage the good warfare. I want to come back to that this morning, and I want to look at it more deeply as we consider the rest of this chapter. All right, in verses 18 through 20, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected, uh, concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may not, uh, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Pray with me just a moment, Lord. We thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, we ask you to uh, open our hearts and minds to understanding this morning. Uh, Lord, we know that there's spiritual warfare being fought around us, Lord, even as we speak. And Lord, we know that we are uh, participants in that in that war, Lord, that we are a soldier's call, Lord, to uh, uh, to wage the good warfare, to fight the noble war. Lord, help us understand how we're to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last Sunday we, we saw how Paul was reminding Timothy uh, that we're all in the midst of spiritual warfare. So he tells Timothy, he says, fight the good fight, uh, wage uh, the good warfare, fight, fight the noble war. Peter pretty much tells us the same thing. He tells us uh, in warning, he says in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And we talked a lot about that last week about the, the demonic attacks, the satanic attacks that come in the spiritual warfare upon God, upon Christ, upon the church, upon us as individual Christians. Paul understood this war as much as any man could understand. There was a time when Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, he said, a, a thorn in the flesh was given me a messenger of Satan to buffet me. So Paul understood the brutality of a satanic attack. Now we don't know exactly what this thorn was. That uh, We don't know uh, what this messenger exactly was. Scripture doesn't tell us that, uh, that Paul was having to deal with. But we know that Paul was under the attack of Satan here. There was a time when Paul and some of his friends wanted to go uh, visit the church at Thessalonica. But Paul told them in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 18, Satan hindered us. Satan hindered the ministry of Paul. So Paul understood the spiritual warfare that we're all involved in. And when he left Timothy in the city of Ephesus to deal with some of the problems in the church there, Paul knew that Timothy was going to come under that same kind of attack. So Paul tells Timothy, wage the good warfare. Wage the good warfare. One of the reasons that Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus was to deal with false teachers who were teaching false doctrine there in the church. Now false teachers and false doctrine are both tools of the devil. 
So Paul certainly knew that when Timothy confronted the false teachers and the doctrines they were teaching, that Satan was going to go on the offense and he was going to attack Timothy. It's always easier. It's always easier uh, to shield the church, to keep false teaching and false doctrine from coming into a church on the onset, it's easier to do that than it is to deal with false teachers and false doctrines that are already established in the church. But that's what Timothy's called to do here. Timothy's called to deal with false teachers and false doctrines that already had a foothold in the church in, in Ephesus. That's always been the case. It would be much easier on the front end if Christians uh, and churches in particular would deal with false teachers and, and, and false doctrine on the front end rather than try to, uh, try to correct those issues uh, once they were established. It wasn't too long ago I was reading an article on a fairly prominent uh, Baptist website called BaptistNews.com. And there's an editor there by the name of uh, Mark Wingfield. And this editor wrote an editorial, an opinion piece, we might call it. And he said, the church, the church needs to change its approach. The church needs to stop using the fear of God as a reason to lead people to saving faith in Jesus Christ and instead simply teach that God love. He said, we, we don't need to be teaching people about judgment, about sin. We don't need to be teaching them about condemnation and hell. We don't need to teach any of that. We simply need to teach that God loves, and that's all they need to know. Basically, in that article, he said, in, in that article, he said, Jesus' death, the sacrificial death on the cross, wasn't nearly as important as the fact that God loves us. That Jesus' death on the cross... Uh, uh, really didn't mean a lot uh, that the prominent thing, uh, the most important thing of all things is that God loves. Now, I, I listen to a man like that and I have to tell you, that's false teaching. That's a false, that's a false teacher who's teaching a false doctrine about salvation. The problem is, is that man is well established. He's, he's uh, thought of as a, 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 a good person thought of as a, he has a good reputation, and he has a large internet platform from which to speak. It's hard to tell, tear down an established stronghold like that. But that's what Timothy was called to do there in Ephesus. He was called to tear down false doctrine and false teaching that was already established in the church. That's a difficult thing to do, a very tough job. And when I heard that, the question that kept coming to my mind was, what was Timothy to do with these false teachers once he rooted them out? Once he got in there and he figured out who they were and addressed the doctrines that they were teaching that were incorrect, what was he to do with those teachers? Was he to, uh, as many teachers, uh, preachers in our, our society today to do, would do it, was he to just kind of smooth things over? Kind of pull those false teachers over to the side and say, hey, look, will, will you please stop teaching that? You know, it's, a, it's kind of messing us up. We need you to change that a little bit. Just, just tweak it a little bit and make it more in line with what we believe here in the church. Just, just kind of smooth it over because we don't want to make any waves. We don't want to cause any problems in the church. Was that how he was to handle it? No. Paul tells him, up in chapter 5, verse 20, he says, If there are two or more witnesses that tell us that these elders, these teachers, are sinning, that they're uh, producing this false teaching, false doctrine, he says, in verse 20, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest uh, also may fear. He says, make an example out of those people that they won't repent. If they won't change, if they won't stop doing what they're doing, bring them before the church, rebuke them in front of the church so that everyone in the church will fear. Can't tell me that Timothy didn't have a tough job to do. Can you imagine what it was like to go into a church when there were established teachers that people respected who were teaching a doctrine that wasn't correct and have to deal with that? 
But that's the job Timothy had to do. Timothy had to do it. Why? Because every pastor, and in this case, Timothy was a pastor there in Ephesus, every pastor is accountable to the God. To God. Every, every pastor is accountable to God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and every pastor, understand this, is accountable to the church. To the church. Look at verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Paul, we know, was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And again, the word apostle simply means a sent one. A sent one. He was hand-selected by Jesus Christ himself to go out and, and to represent Christ in the world. He was an apostle of Christ. But understand, Paul was also an apostle of the church. An apostle of the church. If you remember Paul's ministry, it all began in a church called Antioch. In Antioch. Paul went to Antioch and he worked with the church there and there came a time when the church selected Paul and a fellow by the name of Barnabas and said, you guys, you guys go on a mission trip. You guys go out. We, we want to send you out to proclaim Jesus Christ in other places. So Paul wasn't only just an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was also an apostle, a sent one, a representative of the church. So when Paul commands Timothy to deal with these false teachers, he's telling Timothy, I'm doing this under the authority of the church. The church. Paul was accountable to, responsible to the church. And now the work that he's giving Timothy to do, in that respect, Timothy was now accountable and responsible to the church for the work that he was doing there in the city of Ephesus. Paul says, I charge this charge I commit to you. Uh, the Greek wording there is written in the very same form that would have been prominent, that would have been known in that area in that time as a, as a Roman military command. The same kind of a, a command that a, a centurion might give to a soldier. Go out and do your duty. Go out and do your duty. This is a commandment, a military commandment. Those of you who've been in the military, you know that's indisputable. You don't argue with that. You don't question that. When you're given a command military-wise, you just obey the command. And that's what Timothy's uh, told to do here. Paul says, look, this is what I'm telling you to do. Do it. No excuses, no questions. Go out and take care of these false teachers. It's your duty. It's your duty. That's a question, uh, a word I should say, that's rare. Rare in our generation, duty. We hear a lot of people talk about their freedom. We hear a lot of people talking about their rights. How often do you hear people talk about their duty, their responsibility, their accountability? Every pastor, like Timothy, like Paul, is duty-bound. Duty-bound. We are, we are committed to do our duty, both for our Lord and the church. Every Christian is duty-bound. We are commanded to do our duty for the Lord and for the church. Let me remind you of something Jesus once said. He said in Luke 17, verse 10, when you have done all these things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Jesus said, look, I, you have commandments that I've given you to do. When you fulfilled all those commands, when you've done everything that I've commanded you to do, uh, you're unprofitable. You're not going to gain anything personally from that. Nobody's going to pay you for doing that. You're simply doing your duty. It's your duty to be obedient to these commands. Paul, Paul had given Timothy quite a few commands, quite a few orders, you might say, uh, that uh, Timothy had a duty to fulfill. One of my favorites is found in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. Where Paul told Timothy, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, be, uh, be ready out of season, convince, uh, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. That's a command. It's Timothy's duty to preach the word. It's every that's the primary duty, really, of every pastor. 
The word pastor comes from the same word that's translated shepherd in our Bibles. And what's the primary duty of a shepherd? Feed the flock. How does a pastor feed the flock? He gives them the word of God. How I wish that more pastors and more pulpits these days understood that one command. That's our primary duty. Preach the word of God. Yet many pastors and many pulpits across America today, they defer that duty. They shirk that duty. They stand before their congregations and they do a good job telling some stories. They're entertaining. Some of them give good speeches. They like to, uh, they like to give political speeches from the pulpit these days. Some of them like to lecture like a college professor. They'll stand, and Beverly and I were in such a service one time where the, the pastor preached nothing but finance. How to invest your money in the stock market and uh, how, how, to, how to be God-honoring with your money. I've sat through those kinds of sermons before. There are many today who preach nothing but missions. They say uh, uh, they preach missions about going out and digging wells in places where they don't have water in Africa, about going out and, uh, and building orphanages in places where there have been wars and parents have died and nobody's there to take care of the kids. They, uh, they preach messages about, uh, uh, about going somewhere to replace roofs on houses that have been blown off in storms. And they preach messages about feeding the hungry, and there's nothing wrong with all of those things. But I understand whenever a pastor begins to preach finance or political issues or storytelling or uh, missions or community service as if that's equal to the Word of God, I tell you, it isn't. It isn't. It's sad that there are many pastors who do not preach the Word of God, yet we're commanded to do so. Paul understood that that's our duty. And he's telling Timothy in these cases, you're responsible to the Lord for doing that, and you're also responsible to the church. Part of the problem is that the church doesn't hold their pastor accountable for carrying out the duty that he's supposed to carry out. So as a church, you have a responsibility to hold me as your pastor accountable now Paul's command here to Timothy, in this case, is a relatively simple command. It's found up in verse 3. He said, I urge you when I went to into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly education which is in faith. So Paul says, I command you, Timothy, to command some who were there in Ephesus not to teach false doctrine, not to teach a false gospel. He says, no matter how highly acclaimed they are, no matter what their reputation is there in the church, you've got to deal with them. Paul commissioned, he commissioned, he commanded Timothy to do this. This is his, this is his duty. This is his, his work. He says, be true. Be true, Timothy, to the commandments of God. Be true to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Beware, beware of people who come in and, and try to proclaim something new, something different. Look, Jesus gave the gospel directly to Paul. And then Jesus gave Paul Doctrine, sound doctrine, straight from the mouth of the Lord. That's where Paul learned it. Scripture tells us he spent three years out in the desert. And Christ uh, taught Paul that entire time. So Paul had the same, uh, the same amount of uh, training, you might say, from Jesus Christ our Lord as did Peter or James or John or any of the others. He understood it straight from the mouth of the Lord. Now Paul took that same gospel and that same doctrine, that truth, and he passed it down to young men like Timothy and Titus, and he told them in Scripture, find faithful men that you can pass it on to, who will find faithful men they can pass it on to, who will find faithful men they can pass it on to, for generation across generation until that same gospel and that same doctrine comes down to us. We need to be aware of anyone who comes in with a new idea. A new idea, a new thought, a new vision. Be careful of people who do that. 
who changed the doctrine, who changed the gospel. Beware of anybody that comes in and says, look, I, I, I've got a new idea regarding salvation here. I've got, a, I've got a new idea of how to make the gospel more relative to the culture around us. I, I've got a new theology. I've got a new twist on doctrine. And I understand, I'm not talking about contemporary Christian music here. I'm not talking about drums in church or electric instruments. I'm not talking about the use of modern technology and the internet and social media platforms and all, all of that has its place. What I'm talking about here is beware of people who want to change the message, who want to change uh, the message of salvation, the truth about salvation that comes through faith. By the grace of God and Jesus Christ, be careful of people who want to who want to twist that. Be careful of those who twist the, the obvious doctrines of Scripture. I'm not talking here about large <coughs> churches versus small churches or, or new churches versus old churches. I'm talking about people who want to twist and change and turn sound doctrine. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, hold fast. The pattern of sound words which you heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Hang on to the good words that you heard, Timothy. Pass those words on to others and tell them to hang on to them too. Don't stray away from that. Don't stray away from that faith. Timothy, Timothy had received his commission to do the work that he was doing. Scripture tells us about the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands. Up in chapter 4, 1 Timothy 4, verse 14, Paul says, Do not neglect, Timothy, the gift that, uh, that is in you, which was given to given you by prophecy with the laying on of hands uh, of the eldership. So the elders of the church had placed their hands upon Timothy, and in doing so, they were confirming that he had been gifted, that he had been called by God to enter the ministry, to do ministry work. We kind of lost that today. Today we would call it ordination. That's a word we hear often in churches, ordaining those who are in church leadership. But there are many, many today. And I hear it more and more often in Southern Baptist circles uh, that say there's no need for ordination. No need for ordination. Seminary degrees are a much better credential than the laying on of hands in a church. And so we, we don't need we don't need to ordain our church leadership anymore. That that's a that was an old term. It wasn't really very well defined in Scripture, and I, I disagree. For centuries, the church had a tradition of the elders in the church laying their hands upon those that were called into church ministry and confirming them, ordaining them, saying, look, we understand and we agree that this person is gifted and called uh, to be a minister of our Lord Jesus Christ. In some churches, this idea of ordination has become nothing more than a, an honorary ceremony. Remember, I tell you, a few years ago, I was kind of upset when I learned that a large church in our area, Brentwood Baptist Church, had, uh, had ordained a woman because uh, they wanted to honor her for the work she had done with senior citizens. So they went through whole, the whole ordination process with her. As they were ordaining her, the, the pastor there, and I saw some of it on video, kept stumbling over himself as he kept using the word pastor. He didn't mean to. He'd say pastor and then he'd correct himself because he wasn't ordaining her to be a pastor, but normally that's what you do. But that's not ordination. That's not what ordination is for. Ordination is for recognition. Recognition of those who have been called to be pastors or elders within the church or, or bishops, or the scripture uses that word, overseers, deacons. That's what uh, this ordination, this laying on of hands is all about. Maybe, maybe someday we'll have time to get more depth, you might say, into the ordination process and what that's all about and the meaning of ordination. But for right now, I think it's enough for us to understand uh, that in modern terms, uh, Timothy had been ordained. 
He had received the laying on of hands. He had been recognized by the church as being gifted and called to the ministry. And that made, that made Timothy accountable to and responsible to the church. Today, every pastor that is gifted and called by God is ordained in that same way. Should be ordained in that same way. And every pastor that is gifted and called by God and recognized by the church as being called and gifted for the work of the ministry uh, is accountable to and responsible to the church. The church. And Paul he tells Timothy in verse 19, he uses a couple of words there. He says, having faith and a good conscience. Those two words, those two traits, they, they appear together two or three times in this, this short letter that Paul writes to Timothy. Back up in verse 5, uh, he told Timothy uh, to be, uh, uh, he talked there about good conscience and sincere faith. We hear that again in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 9, he says, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. So we keep hearing these words, faith and conscience, used in unison. They're used at the same time. I want you to understand, when Paul uses those words, faith, in that context, he's not talking about saving faith. Timothy's saving faith wasn't in question. Paul knew that uh, uh, Timothy was a saved Christian, otherwise he wouldn't have left him there in Ephesus to do this work. So, saving faith for Timothy wasn't the question. What Paul was telling Timothy there was, have faith in the power of the gospel and the sound doctrine that you learned. Don't shy away from it. Don't stray from that. Hang on to it. Hold on to it. Don't let go of that, Timothy. Hang on. Have faith in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the sound doctrine of the Scripture. As we move through this letter, we're going to hear Paul talking about people that have strayed from that faith. Back up in verse 6, he said, Some, having strayed, have turned aside the idle talk. We get to chapter 6, verse 10. He says, some have strayed from the faith. He says the same thing in verse 21 of that chapter. Some have strayed concerning the faith. Here he's telling Timothy, you can't do that. You can't stray away from the faith. You can't stay away from the firm tradition of sound doctrine and the true gospel message that you've been taught. Don't abandon the truth of God. Don't abandon the word of God. And the pastors in our nation today who need to understand that commandment. Our obligation as pastors is to hang on to the faith, to hang on to the truth of the Word of God, the true gospel and true doctrine. Yet many, Paul says, have gone astray. Have gone astray. He says you need to have a good conscience. Conscience. That's a gift from God. Your conscience is a gift from God. It's a mechanism that God has placed inside of you that tells you whether what you're thinking or what you're saying or what you're doing is right or wrong. When your conscience is bothering you because you're not doing something right and you're thinking something that's wrong or saying something that's wrong, that's a gift from God. That's the Holy Spirit correcting you. But I understand in order for your conscience to work correctly, it has to be tied to the faith. It has to be tied to the faith. If it's not, then your conscience won't work correctly. Your conscience will be defiled. If you don't have faith, if you don't have faith in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you don't have faith in the sound doctrine of Scripture, then your conscience isn't going to work correctly. A true Christian, if you are indeed a true believer in Jesus Christ, when you're living under the power of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you're living a life uh, that measures up to the word, that measures up to sound doctrine, when you're living obediently, then you're going to find yourself at peace. There's going to be a peace in your heart, peace that passes all understanding. It's going to be there. But if you're a Christian... And somehow you're not living according to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're not living according to sound doctrine. You're not going to have any peace. Because your conscience is going to bother you. That means your conscience is good. 
When you're living outside the will of God and your conscience is bothering you, that means your conscience is good. Your conscience will turn you around. It will correct you. It will, it will lead you into repentance. But I understand there's some people who have strayed from the faith. They don't understand the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't live by true doctrine. They don't, they don't understand true doctrine. Because of that, their conscience is devolved. They don't correct themselves. And Scripture says they're not good for any good work. There's nothing that they can do that's of any use to the kingdom of God. Why? Paul tells Timothy, no, Titus. Paul tells Titus in Titus 1 verse 15, to those who are devolved and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are devolved. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. And let, me, let me tie all this together for you. Sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. When you're taught <coughs> sound doctrine, when you're taught the true gospel of Jesus Christ, you understand the faith. And when you understand the faith, your conscience is good. And whenever you're out of line with sound doctrine, you will be corrected. But if you don't understand the faith, if you've received a false doctrine, and you've been taught a false, a false gospel, then your conscience is defiled and it's useless to you. It, it won't correct you. Those are the very same people that say that evil is good and evil and good is evil. They get it mixed up. They don't understand. And Scripture says they're not good for anything when it comes to the work of the kingdom. I feel sorry for people that are constantly exposed to false teachers who are pressing them with false doctrine because their consciences are defiled and they're unable to correct themselves. That's why these false teachers are so dangerous. They affect the people, the lives of, of many people. Peter warns us in 2 Peter 2 verse 1, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there, uh, there will be false teachers among you. When he says the people, there he's talking about back in the Old Testament, there were false uh, prophets uh, among the Jews, the people, even so, he says, there will be false teachers among you, the church, who will secretly bring destructive heresies, even deny the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves with destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. The way of truth is blasphemed by false teachers. What was it that caused uh, Paul to put these false teachers that he, he put out of the church out. What, what was it that, uh, that, he, uh, that he put out Hymenaeus and, and uh, Alexander for? It was for teaching this false doctrine, for blaspheming. They blasphemed the, the truth of God. Paul tells Timothy, while you're there in Ephesus, wage the good warfare against those who have strayed from the faith, who have strayed from the truth, and who have defiled their conscience. That was Paul's command to Timothy. That same command goes to every pastor. That's part of my charge. Part of my charge is to warn you about false teachers and false doctrine. That's part of what God calls me to do. We must deal with this. We must deal with this issue. It is, a, it is our Christian duty to do so. Paul said some, some there in Ephesus, and he gives us a few names there in verse 19, concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom were Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may, not, uh, uh, that they may learn not to blaspheme. I want you to understand this clearly. Both Jesus Christ, our Lord, and Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ in various places in Scripture, command us that there are times when certain people need to be put out of the church. Put out. That's not a suggestion in Scripture. That is a commandment of Scripture. Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, verse 15, Moreover, if your brother, and understand he's talking about a Christian here, a brother, a believer... If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault against you and him alone. Just let it be between you and him, you and that person. 
If he hears you, you've got your brother. But if he will not hear, if he won't listen to you, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every good word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, then tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. In those days, a heathen, not being a non-believer, and a tax collector, they were, they were shunned. Nobody would eat with them. Nobody would, nobody would talk to them. They were exiled. They were put out. There was a time when there was a, a sinning man in the church in Corinth. And Paul told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. To deliver such a person to Satan is to put them out of the church. That's what that means. When you deliver someone over to Satan, that means you've taken them out of the safety and the confines of the church, and you put them out into the world, the world that is under the temporary rule of the prince of the air. Satan himself. That's what it means to deliver someone over to Satan. Paul did that. He did that to two members of the church there in Ephesus. It's Thomas and Hymenaeus and Alexander. He put them out of the church. He lists their names there in verse 20. Hymenaeus and Alexander. I thought about that. That's a terrible thought to me. To be turned over to Satan. To be delivered unto Satan. That's, a, that's an awful thought in my mind. Nobody should want that to happen. But I understand that's what God does. Back in the book of Romans, we studied some time ago in Romans 1 verse 24, therefore God also gave them up. Verse 26, that same chapter, for this reason God gave them up. Verse 28, God gave them over. Why did God do this? Why did God give these people over? Up in verse 18, because they suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. Same thing that Paul Put these two men out where they blaspheme. They tell lies. They tell lies that, uh, that distort the word of God. They, te uh, they, tell, uh, they, 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 uh, they tell stories. They, they, tell, uh, uh, they teach false doctrine that leads people to believe that they're saved when they are. It's blasphemy. Why did Paul deliver these two men? Verse 20, that they may learn not to blaspheme. That's what false teachers do. They suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. They, they blaspheme the word of God. What should be done with them? Well, they should be turned over to Satan. I hope and pray that there's never a day that comes to Midland Baptist Church where we have to deal with this. But should that day come, we must do it. We must. Should that day come, we must. It's never easy. It's never an easy thing to do. It's never an easy task to administer church discipline. It's not easy to put someone you love out of the church to turn them over to Satan. But there are times when it must happen. But understand, we do that out of love. It may not sound like it, but we do that out of love. Remember what Paul said about that man that he put out of the church there in Corinth. He said he did that so in verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5, his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Christ. Whenever we put someone out of the church for disciplinary reasons, the hope is that they will turn around that they'll change their heart, that they'll change their mind, that they'll repent of the sins that they've committed, and that they'll be restored to the body, restored to the church. But understand, even if they don't, even if they don't, we still have a responsibility and accountability to the church, to protect the church. Paul said in that same, in that same passage, verse 7 of chapter 5, 1 Corinthians, therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. Leaven, in that case, throughout most of Scripture, represents sin. 
Paul says that there's sin in the church. Purge that sin out. Purge that sin out so that you remain a new lump. You remain unleavened. The church is to be pure. The church is the pure bride of Christ. When sin comes up in the church and people refuse to repent of the sin, we must purge the leaven out in hopes that those people will, when they are delivered to Satan, correct themselves, that they'll repent and be restored to the body. In this particular case, in this particular command, Paul's telling Timothy, you must purge the sin of false teaching and false doctrine out of the church there in Ephesus. We've got to do the same. The best thing for us to do is protect ourselves because I don't think we have it here. And I'm not insinuating at all that there's any false teaching or, or false uh, doctrine being proclaimed in our church here at Midland, but we need to be aware of these things and we need to be willing to deal with it should it show up. Hopefully we won't let it come in, but should it show up, we must deal with it. As Paul tells Timothy in verse 18, we must wage it. The good warfare. I'm going to end there this morning. Hopefully there was a little bit of shortening in that message. Maybe it wasn't too long. Next Sunday, I'm looking forward as we move into chapter 2. Paul's going to change directions. He's going to change directions and he's going to give us a, a good uh, teaching about prayer. About prayer. And specifically, uh, the teaching there is about praying for the law, evangelistic prayer. And I think that's a message we really need to hear. I know it spoke to me as I was preparing for it, and I think it'll speak to you as well, about praying for the lost. But we'll end there this morning, and as we close, let's, let's stand and prepare to sing number 324. 324, have you been to college?
given us through Paul's writing this morning, Lord, we know this is the word of God. Uh, Lord, let us, uh, let us not stray from the faith. Let us be aware that there are false teachers out there, false doctrines being proclaimed. Lord, let us, uh, let us study your word, let us know your word, let us be as the Bereans and uh, examine and study deeply into the word of God to see whether or not these things are so. Lord, let us, uh, let us never uh, uh, become victims of false teachers and false doctrines. Lord, let us understand the truth and know the truth. Lord, we know that there are uh, those around us in this community that do not know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray that you'll speak into their life. Lord, that you can use this church evangelistically or, or Lord, that somehow you'll just reach those people, Lord, that uh, we, we pray that those that are lost, uh, that they will come to know the Lord and Savior, Lord, if there's anything we can do to, uh, to, to make that happen, Lord, use us. Send us out, do whatever, do whatever needs to be done, Lord, in this community to spark revival and that those that are uh, in their homes this morning, those that are uh, uh, in denial, Lord, of the, of the true salvation that comes through saving faith in Jesus Christ by the grace of God, Lord, we pray that, uh, uh, that by the power of the Holy Spirit they'll come to know that truth and that they'll respond. And Lord, that they'll be uh, men and women of God, children of God, Lord, that, uh, uh, that the church will be multiplied as those uh, who hear your word come into the kingdom. Lord, it's a watch over, lead us and God, keep us safe as we leave here and go out uh, into, into a world that sometimes is cruel and uh, and uh, unsafe. And Lord, we just ask you to watch over us, keep us safe, and uh, especially, Lord, this coming week, protect the children in the schools and the teachers there, Lord, that you'll uh, protect the colleges and the high schools and the elementary schools and the, uh, the preschools, all these places where children are gathered. Lord, that you'll uh, not let any harm come there. Lord, bless us and keep us and uh, uh, watch over us until we come together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.